Everybody, thanks for tuning in today. I am here with a dear friend of mine who is a fabulous photographer and just a wonderful guy. And I've known him for a long time. Everyone, this is Mike Ruiz. Mike, say hi to hey. everybody. Hey, everyone. <laughs> thanks so much hey, for joining us. Hordes and hordes of fans out there. The hordes and all <laughs> hundreds of my followers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself. How did you get into the industry? <clears throat> oh God, I'm, I tell this story so many times. I, I need to find a new slant on it because I'm so tired. It sounds like a broken record, but basically I got a camera for, as a gift when I was in my late twenties and I, you know, I became consumed with shooting, you know, up in the box and my cam, you know, my, my gift, um, which was a camera. And I just began shooting like everything in sight, literally like bugs, flowers, you know, like, anything architecture and um i kind of settled on people and um and i was so like consumed with it and obsessed with it that i don't know like i would just i was cranking out like content like you know be, this is before like you had you had to produce content constantly i was producing content constantly like i was shooting seven days a week you know it was costing me a fortune because it was all old school like film and negatives and prints and yeah. you know but, um, but that's, that's what I did. I was literally shooting seven days a week and, you know, like I would shoot something and, and it was done and I'd move on to the next thing. And, but, you know, the people that were involved in all of this stuff, you know, just started like showing other people and like, oh, you know, check this guy out. He just shot me for this thing. And, and it just kind of snowballed from there. And then I started getting like calls like, oh, do you want to shoot for our magazine? And, and then I started doing that. And then ad agencies started calling me and, I mean, it sounds really easy now, but <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, but it kind it's of was, I mean, you know, like, I mean, I worked my ass off, you know, but because I was so focused on the creative obsession that I had, like I wasn't, per, my perception of it wasn't like, oh, I'm working so hard towards a goal, you know, like mm -hmm. I was just doing it, cranking it out and putting it out and forgetting about it, you know, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like it was just nonstop content production. Yeah. Um, you know, and then, you know, and then, you know, there was, and then after about a year and a half of doing that, of, of being asked to do, you know, all sorts of stuff, I'm like, oh, okay, well, this wasn't as hard as I thought it would be. So I went to, I went to, what I did was I, I scheduled the trip to London and um, I went to the magazine stand in London <clears throat> and I picked out like 20 magazines that I, I'm like, oh, I want to shoot for them. And oh, I want to, oh, this one, what's this one? British Vogue, I want to shoot for them. So I, I bought all the magazines and I looked who all the editor in chiefs were and I literally called and, you know, most of them hung up on me. Sure. Right. I was like, so I didn't know how the business worked. You know, like I was self-taught. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about protocol or anything. So sure. I'm like calling all these editors and a couple of them were kind of intrigued by my, my naivete or my stupidity or whatever. So I got, I ended up getting some appointments and I ended up shooting with some, you know, for some like great, my very first editorial ever was published in Attitude Magazine. Oh yeah. And from that, I got a bunch of like, like from that one story, I got like a ton of European advertising, like a ton of editorial. I was shooting for Mondo Womo. I was shooting covers for Mondo Womo back then, which not, um, it would, not Womo Vogue, I don't know if you remember Mondo Womo. I do remember it, yeah. You know, it kind of went under, which sucks, but because I was doing all the covers. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, it kind of like just, you know, kind of took off, you know, yeah. I was just, and then I came back to the States and I was shooting paper magazine covers and, you know, shooting for interview and like all these cool mags and. So crazy how that <clears throat> takes off from like, just a love of it and then being willing to just go for it. Like just yeah. absolutely relentlessly go for it and I do think there's something charming about just stumbling in and being like so how does this work you know and people <laughs> kind of going okay sure you know that's kind of funny I love that I think that's great and I, I have to say I do feel like um, that makes sense that you just kind of like barrel through like knowing what you're like on set like working with you you're such a pleasant person you're such a like you create a lovely environment around so even if you just popped into a room where nobody knew you, I can understand you immediately making the making that a comfortable setting. You know, like making whoever you're meeting with go, sure, okay, let's give them a shot. You know what I mean? Like I could see that happening for you. Oh, cool. That's funny. All right, I want to ask you about something that I am obsessed with, that you've done, 
Mm -hmm. I bothered you about this before, but never on one. But um, you shot Prince mm -hmm. <laughs> for, oh. I think it was for the Welcome to, for his last major world tour, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I shot him for a bunch of stuff. I was like one of the last people to, to photograph him. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, like the weirdest, most surreal stuff happened working with him. Um, just because, I mean, you know, like of everyone that I've ever worked for, like he's, you know, like I grew up with him. I mean, he was like, you know, like I would, I would, I was like one of those people who get teary eyed if I saw him on TV. You know, like seven, you know, 16, 17 years old, right? See Prince and I'd be like, oh yeah, I love you. <laughs> so, you know, so then I was up for this Ebony cover with him and he saw like, you know, he, like they sent him like 300 portfolios and he picked mine, which, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I was like, what me and then and then of course he he only would shoot at paisley park so he flew us all to paisley park and and you know he's very standoff you know i mean he, you know i mean people know he's kind of, he was he was just very standoffish and very guarded and so which he was and then and then with the shoot came out and it was great and he loved it and and you know and again like you know hopefully you know maybe he he picked up on that character trait that you just mentioned because he was like like then he started requesting me for everything, like everything he would do. So he'd be like, you know, and I always get this call. Like it was never him who would call me. They're like, I get a call and be like, please hold for Prince. That's <laughs> so great. I love that. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I'm like, shut up, everyone, shut up. <laughs> um, so it was, it was, you know, it was cool. And then like, I think you were at Madison Square Garden when, right? Was that you? I was, I watched you get up on stage. I have never, ever in my life been professionally jealous of anyone <laughs> until that moment when I was like, is that Mike? <laughs> I was I, yeah. but also at the same time thrilled for you, obviously. And I just thought I had a really good seat. So I was looking directly at the stage. I was pretty close to, I was at stage level. Oh, cool. And when I saw you climb up, I was like, oh my God, I could not get over myself. That was so fun. That was, that was weird. That was one of like the really like surreal things to be called up on stage by Prince at Mad you know, packed house at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. But like, you know, when we shoot at Paisley Park, like there was once I was shooting there and it was just me and my assistant and a writer from Rolling Stone. And he's like, hey, you guys want to hear my new tracks? So and, you know, he has a big performance space at Paisley Park. Excuse me, and he just, um, he just got up on stage with his band and started, you know, and it was just like me, my assistant and this writer right from the concert. Oh. Basically. Yeah, yeah, which was crazy. Incredible. That is absolutely incredible. I mean, you are you are occupying a very rarefied air. There are very few people that can claim to have that kind of experience with any major rock star, because truthfully, that level of rock star doesn't exist in modern music anymore. That's mm -hmm. not a thing anymore. No, everyone. Everyone's like hyper accessible now. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that level of inaccessibility. I mean, he and he was the least accessible of all of them, you know, of like all Michael time. Jackson, of like, he was the least accessible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we had to, we had to, the first time I went, we had to, we had to show the security people our phones to make sure that we, we didn't take photos or record. Oh, wow. You know, so like, you know, we, it was part of the deal. Like we either agreed to that or we didn't do the shoot. I'm like, oh, take my phone, <laughs> take it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, that makes sense. I get that because he was, he was very controlled with his image and stuff. So I can understand yeah. that wanting like. Yeah, and his, his estate continues to be, I mean, he like, the, you know, the there was there were a couple of images that they didn't own at, when he passed and his estate, you know, like bought, bought everything. So like, I don't own any Prince images anymore. Really? Yeah, they, they own everything. And they did that with everybody. Like Prince's yeah. estate, there's nothing out there that can be syndicated or anything. Wow. Except through the Prince estate. Yeah, I mean, they, that's, <coughs> but I guess it makes sense, you know what I mean? If you want to have control of everything, because somebody like that has such a massive fan base, he could, they released some albums recently of like old stuff or whatever, and they made a killing. They still sell. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, he has hundreds and hundreds of unreleased tracks. Incredible. Incredible. Mm -hmm. How cool that you got to do that. I love that. I did get to tour Paisley Park after he passed, I was in Minneapolis for a job for an entirely different thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I flew in 
a day before the job, like the client, I booked my ticket and I changed the ticket so I could fly in and just tour Paisley Park and then go to work. <laughs> yeah. And it was totally worth it. It was amazing. But that's great. I love that story. And I was always like, so happy for you. And also like, oh my God, I'm so jealous. Yeah. yeah. That is fantastic. So now I'm doing, now I'm doing e-com. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You're like, you know what though? I know, I know. That is such a, oh, it's so funny. Those incredible moments in our business are so incredible that you're like, oh, this was magical. And then, you know, the following Monday, they're, they're like, can you do Gap? And you're like, sure. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know? I mean, I don't, you know. I but mean, I mean, you know, we got to pay our bills, you know? Yeah, it's well, a business. You know. What was it? Say that again? It's a business, you know I mean? It's yeah. fun and creative and everything, but I mean, you know, we all have to make a living at it too, so That's we got to make some, comprom some creative compromises. It's true. It becomes harder, I think, when your art is your commerce, right? Then you find yourself getting a little bit funny about it, but it's work yeah. at the end of the day. Um, how are you maintaining, because you are someone, even though you don't, you're someone who works all the time. You know what I mean? And I know we're a lot like that. Like, how are you maintaining your, I, I don't know if I should say excitement or inspiration, or how are you keeping yourself going in this last year and change, given that it's been so, with the pandemic and everything else that's happened, it's been, it's been crazy. It's kind of put the brakes on a lot of stuff. How are you keeping yourself going? Um, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm motivated by necessity out of, the necessity to be ex to express myself like in, in any way like you know because for for a while there was i wasn't i wasn't you know like when the pandemic hit i wasn't shooting anything there was nothing to be shot so i started you know just to just to kind of so i started shooting myself <laughs> um and then you know i started and then i started and then i and i did that out cover which led to like a million other like i was doing all this press and stuff of me you know so i was i would shoot myself or i'd have I have creative direct shoots for myself. So that was one way to kind of keep my creative juices flowing. But then I just, I also, you know, like I, out of necessity to, you know, to survive, I get, I get so like demoralized if I'm not being productive. Yeah. Um, so I got to do stuff all the time. So, you know, wh wherever there was, wherever the opportunities were lacking, I just like created opportunities. You know, I started creative directing a lot. I started, I started working with um, a couple of magazines where like I'm, regular you know one of them i'm on the masthead as a creative director and um and then i contribute to um another a couple of other titles that <clears throat> that I, I i'm just like you know I'm, I'm helping orchestrate like raising the profile and stuff amazing so that's um you know so i've been like i've been i just kind of always i've always been that way you know like if like if somebody's like oh no you know you can't you know like if, if there's no opportunity to be had somewhere i'll create it yeah yeah you've yeah. always had a lot of irons on the fire anyway from the time I met you. So it seems that that makes sense to me that you're like, I can make something happen. One of these things will pan out. One of these things will work out or multiple ones will. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. I like that. And I like the keeping yourself. You're, I'm the same way. I feel like you have to, I think everyone's like that. You have to have a purpose. You have to have something to do. Otherwise the days just bleed into each other and you sort of start to lose your mind, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I understand that. So what do you think is going to happen, man? Where do you see the industry heading? I don't know. I don't, you know, like, I just, I can't predict it anymore. You know, back in the good old days, you could kind of, you could kind of count on the fact that if you did A, B, and C, that D would happen, but mm -hmm. everything is so completely random now. You could, you know, like these kids are, you know, like going from zero because they have like, I don't know. I mean, I don't even want to talk about social media and like followers and stuff and how everything is being dictated by that. Cause it's, that's actually dying out now. Like, I feel like, I feel like people are, are getting back to the art of it and they're not yeah. relying on like, Oh, he has like a million followers. Let's hire him. You know, cause I, I think that's losing its luster. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a good, and we're good because, you know, like we've created a, a culture of, of mediocrity with that. Yeah. You know, like everything is mediocre. It's based on, it's not based on talent or or integrity. It's based on some random thing, you know, because somebody does like funny dances on TikTok, you know, they're kind of they're shooting the next Gucci campaign, you know. But I mean, that's that's yeah. I mean, you know, like I'm sure we've all like beat our heads against the wall about all of that 
for so long that and you know I I just I generally feel genuinely feel like it's it's drifting out. I mean, there's always going to be that segment of the business can be driven by that. Sure. But but like there's people who need a little bit more stimulation than you know than a TikTok dance. Yeah, I also yeah. think they haven't seen those things turn. I think they thought if he has a million followers, they imagined that turning instantly into money for them. And that right. hasn't happened. No, that's not, that's the other thing too. Like the people, you know, the days of paying, you know, Kim Kardashian $150,000 for a post. I mean, I don't know if people are still doing it, but there's no pay, there's no payoff from that. Yeah, yeah. You know, like you don't, like you, you get, you know, like people who do that. I mean, people have paid me to, to make posts for them, you know, and and they get like, you know, like 10 followers out of it or, you know what I mean? Like there's, it's not, it's not equitable for them to, to do that anymore. I mean, yes. I, I never, I never, I don't know if it ever was because there's so many people who have a million plus followers, just random people yeah. who do nothing, you know, yeah. except for like, you know, have great bodies or, you know, they're good at like, you know, twerking or something or doing the, the floss. I love it. The floss. Yeah. I never, I never nailed that dance, by the way. I never got it. I finally got it. I finally got it. No. <laughs> You're like, and it's over. I don't understand. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I got it. And everyone's like, <laughs> it's funny. Like I've been on jobs where they'll book models who they'll have models and then they'll have somebody that's like big on Instagram or big on TikTok. And that happened a lot for a while. And I was on this one job, a beauty job. Okay. And this girl showed up. They had never met her in person. They just booked her via her Instagram. The retouching she does on herself is crazy. Mm -hmm. I mean, she didn't have any hair. Her <laughs> face looked totally different. We were like, uh, and we made it happen, of course. But then you realize this is, that's, that's a whole make-believe world happening. I mean, we're already in a make-believe world. We don't need people who are even more delusional. You know, like it's, it was just too, it was out of hand. I think, I do think you're right. I think people are, it, it, social media will always have some aspect now. That's the new normal, but I do think that it's lost its level of importance. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and I mean, I think, I think, I mean, hopefully people are starting to understand the, the damage that it's doing, mm. you know, to, to our culture, you know, like teen suicide teen suicide rates are through the roof, you yeah. know, 2011 when, when that's when social media really took hold. I mean, did you, did you watch the- um, Social the, Dilemma? Yeah. Yeah, it was so, awesome. All of that stuff. Like, you know, we've all been influenced by, negatively by social media. You yeah. Know? I don't, I mean, I just have like a, a real, I have a, a hate, hate relationship with it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's true though. And you know, what's funny is I have had this conversation so many times with so many people who are really successful in their own right. Like I have had multiple conversations with people who I looked at as going, Oh, I would love to have their situation. And you talk to them and they're, and I knew this one guy who was a photographer who was like, I got off Instagram. I couldn't stand seeing that this person was shooting Italian Vogue one day and then taking their kids skiing in Switzerland the next day. How is that even possible? Like, how are you, you know what I mean? You're like, it's true. Everyone's presenting this fake life and it's not, mm -hmm. I mean, I get it. And a, a part of me loves it, but another part of me just goes, that's okay in its place. Like ice cream. Yeah. Okay in its place, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, like I, I really, tr I really try not to let it, define me you know like I I mean I'm not gonna lie like I put out you know again like I, I'm, I'm I've always been a big content producer yeah or in, before social media so you know that's not that hasn't changed you know so I'm always like producing stuff um so it seems like I'm doing a lot of stuff and I am I mean I'm shooting a lot of stuff but like I, I mean I'm not I'm not doing it I don't know I don't know how to say this I mean I'm not I'm not doing it to for a pat on, you know, for, for that right. pat on, I'm not doing it for like self-esteem issues, like to like, I'm doing it because it's like a business. If I didn't have to, you know what the other thing too, I do a lot of animal rescue and it's been fantastic for, I mean, we've, I've saved hundreds and hundreds of dogs just from networking them on social media. Really? Um, yeah. What's the name of the rescue? Oh wait, I think oh, I, oh. The name of the I, I do tons of stuff. I just started, the, I just started uh, work on, um, 
there's an or organization called Stand Up for Pitts Foundation, and they do tremendous work with the uh, much maligned um, pit bull type dog. Yeah. You know, I have an affinity for because I, I fell in love with one and I have one and, um, you know, they were both the loves of my life. So I do a lot to like help them. And I just started a campaign called the Hope Campaign where I go to, sh to shelters where dogs are in danger of being euthanized or where they're just deteriorating from being in the shelter too long. And, and, um, and they're dogs that are not getting seen or they're dogs that are being overlooked because, you know, they're really nervous in their, in their cage at the shelter and they just don't show well. So I photograph them, you know, I do like really beautiful portraits of them and I do videos of them and, and then we network them and 100% of the dogs that we, I've been, I've done for this campaign over the years have gotten adopted. Like wow, that's so cool. That's amazing. <clears throat> and then I do other stuff too. I do, I do a calendar every year. It's out now. It's called Pities and Pecks. Um, and it benefits a rescue in Philadelphia called Philly Bully Team. So that's another thing that I'm plugging. That's awesome. <laughs> Phillybullyteam.com. Get your calendar now. Yeah. Well, I'll put the, when I put this on my Instagram to promote or whatever, I'll have that. It's all going to be down there. So we'll put it all on it. Cool. That's awesome. Oh my goodness. That's so cool. I love that. That's exactly, that is exactly what you were saying. Like you have all these different things happening. And I do think that's the, that's the only way I think the rest of the world is starting to catch up with you. Like you've always been a go-getter. And I think now we realize that's the only way to move forward, especially given the way things are. Keep ourselves busy. Find something that we can get into instead of sitting around waiting for things to come to us. You know what I mean? Right. And another, another good thing to do too is use stuff for leverage. You know, like, I mean, you know, I have a pretty decent following and I, I've never, you know, I don't, to me, it's not a pat on the back. It's like, oh, you know, like I, I have all these followers. To me, I'm like, okay, I have all these followers. How am I going to maximize? How am I going to use, use, not use them? How am I going to maximize having this stuff? Yeah. You know, to, to actually benefit somebody or something, you know, not, not just like, you know, so that I can get like $50 so I can be a brand ambassador for, you know, like freaking yeah. jeans. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what though? That's great because just like there's somebody who needs to be put in front of an audience so that they can get the help that they need. Oftentimes there are so many people, many of whom are in your audience who want to do something good, want to contribute to something good, but don't know how to go about doing it. Mm -hmm. Don't know who to reach out to, don't know how. And once you make that connection, you make it very easy for everyone to do the thing that they want to do, which is cool. Yeah, because a lot of that's, you know, that's how I was, you know, I'm like, oh, how do I, I want to help, I want to help, I want to give back, I want to, you know, everyone says they want to do it, but it just seems like a daunting thing to like, get started and yeah, but like, but you're right, like, I, I, I wasn't intimidated by that. And I, you know, I did it. And I do a lot of LGBTQ stuff. And yeah, like, but I'm, I'm good, I'm good conduit for people. Like if people, they oh, well, I want to help, but I don't know. Like I've hooked so many photographers up with shelters and stuff to go and photograph dogs and, oh. and network them uh, because they just didn't know how to, you know, how to proceed to do it. So, um, so yeah. So if anyone out there, you know, wants to help in any way, I'll, I'll, I'll set it up for you. That's rad. I love that. I love that. That is a wonderful note to end it on because that's actually really encouraging and cool. Mike, thank you so much for doing this for me. I really appreciate it. Oh, it's thank you for having me. I was honored when you asked. Oh, are you kidding? It's awesome. I am um, looking forward to seeing you again on set soon, my friend. Yep. Looking forward to that. Take care, buddy. Okay.